Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Akanksha Bhatia, and I'm the moderator for the webinar. We will wait for a couple of minutes before we start to allow participants to sign in. Please bear with us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you for your patience. We would like to welcome you all to our webinar series, Contractual Arrangement and Company Law Matters in Times of COVID-19. Today is our four part, today is our four part webinar series. I would now like to hand it over to Mr. Ajay Sethi, our founder and managing partner to take over and give us a brief on the upcoming session. So please, Thank you, Akansha. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Sad to start on the note, but let me first make things clear that we definitely are entering a global recession. It is imminent. The GDP will fall, and so will the aggregate demand. Consumption, too, is going to fall. Market and market patterns will change, and economies will be reshaped. The next six to 18 months will test every aspect of businesses as we know it and their ability to survive. Therefore, these learnings, which we hope to bring to you in the next few days, would be very useful to pick up tips and understanding how do we walk forward from here. With that in perspective, I would like to welcome you to our webinar series, Financial Management and Regulatory Compliances in Times of COVID-19. Today is the second of our four part webinar series. We build these series solely around the concerns of our clients. The first one dealt with building cash reserves given the imminent recession. Today we take up contractual arrangements and corporate law issues as would have bearing in this COVID era. Tomorrow, we will look at financial reporting challenges in times of COVID-19, examining issues in preparing financial statements and their audits. Then on Thursday, we will cover the impact on your tax planning given the very changed circumstances. That's the game plan. As you can see, we tried to sum up the entire financial cycle. Just a little bit about ASA and Associates, though most of you would know and our speakers today. We are a 30-year-old accounting and consulting firm with a team of over 700 professionals spread across eight offices in India. We assist our clients in setting up their businesses, M&A, partner search, audit, risk advisory, taxation, and compliance issues like accounting, payrolls, IFRS, etc. A major part of our focus is on foreign companies setting up and operating in India. Our clients include many of Fortune 500 companies besides our focused approach towards SME. Our speakers today are Mr. Himanshu Srivastava from ASA and Ms. Aparna Ravi 
and Ms. Junaira Rahman from the law firm Samvat Partners. Himanshu Srivastava, our first speaker, heads our business advisory services vertical and also leads the Japan desk. His responsibilities include end-to-end -end business strategy and project management directed at facilitating foreign investments into India and assisting foreign companies set up and operate in India. He is a chartered accountant, a lawyer, and a qualified insolvency professional. Lest he gets upset with me, he is also a very ardent golfer. Moving to Samvat Partner, which is a pan-India full-service corporate law firm specializing in insolvency, M&A, dispute resolution, and labor and employment, amongst others. Let me introduce the speakers. Aparna Ravi, our second speaker, is an expert in insolvency law and is a member of Law Reform Committee constituted by the central government. She also has experience in private equity, venture capital investments, advising on financing and restructuring transactions in multiple jurisdictions. Junaira Rahman, our third and final speaker, advises clients on a broad spectrum of employment law matters, which include structuring employee stock options and benefit plans, statutory compliances, employee terminations, formulation of HR policies, and facilitating inquiries relating to workplace harassment. Last one, I hope, is the least concern every, anybody gets any day. I wish you a very good learning session, and we deeply welcome your feedback. And I, I now hand you over to our very able moderator, Akansha, who is part of our business advisory team at Dell. Thank you, Ajay. Before we begin, please note here, here are a few pointers for the webinar. All the participants will be on listen mode only throughout the webinar. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the question section in the chat. Window should be on the right side of your screen. Presentation will be followed by Q&A. A link to this webinar will be emailed to you in the next afternoon, that is by tomorrow. Each of these four webinars have a separate link. Reach us out if you face any difficulty in accessing them. I would now like to direct this to our first speaker of the day, Mr. Himanshu Srivastav. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Akanksha, for the introduction. Uh, dear participants, I thank you all. Uh, a very good afternoon. We really wish we can give the best summary of the key amendments uh, in the legislations. While they could be more, we had used our discretion to make it make most of this one hour. So uh, I'll be happy to take your questions uh, once uh, the session is uh, nearing completion. I'll move on to the session as of now. Akanksha, would you help me with the slides? Next, please. So as we all know, uh, due to global outbreak of coronavirus, uh, which is an unprecedented event, several restrictions on public and corporate sectors have been imposed. And the ongoing lockdown has led to atmosphere of severe uncertainty and challenges. In order to control the spread of the virus, the government of India has ordered all establishments except organizations providing essential goods and services to temporarily close their physical offices. All employees are now working remotely, but due to difficulties faced in coordination, lack of office facilities, companies are facing difficulties in undertaking timely compliances and meet the procedural requirement of various regulations. Keeping in mind the prevailing situation, Government of India had temporarily uh, relaxed a number of compliances under various regulations and corporate laws. We have analyzed some of the major relaxations from the company law foreign exchange management law and other key regulation perspective uh, before you and uh, the third, next one please so the first change is under the foreign direct investment policy as you all may be aware a non resident entity can invest in india freely in most of the sectors and activities subject to the fdi policy there are certain exceptions uh, like lottery, atomic energy, railways, etc., which are pro prohibited. The government has now introduced a new rule uh, called Press Note Number no. Three, which came into effect on April 17th, 2020, which has made prior government clearances mandatory for any investment coming from countries that share land borders with India. 
it states that an entity of a country which shares land border with india for example china pakistan bangladesh nepal myanmar bhutan and afghanistan or where the beneficial owner of an investment uh, beneficial owner of an investment into india is situated in or is citizen of any such country such entity can invest in india only after obtaining prior approval from the government to to explain it in more simple words let's say uh, if the parent company outside india say is based in united states of america which has a subsidiary or a joint venture in india if such parent company in us receives any further investments from either an entity based in china or from a chinese citizen such transaction amounting to an indirect investment in india will require an approval from the government of india it is pertinent to note here that as to what constitute beneficial ownership has not been defined and hence is causing the pain the government i believe should come out with clarification defining the beneficial ownership norms and the procedures around it the amendment in my view will also be applicable to various multi layer transactions as we see in the new age uh, for example if there is a chinese investment at any level uh, that those kind of investment could be impacted fdi in unlisted securities which are outside the preview of uh, portfolio, portfolio investments will also be impacted with the notification especially on the investments from china due to the change i believe new investment from neighboring countries especially the ones which are in, in investing in india namely china will get impacted in short term i believe the government would surely scrutinize such cases in detail however it is not clear how and how much it will how much time it would take but it would be advisable if the government puts in place a efficient approval mechanism this would definitely help designing much uh, clearer business plans next please uh these are certain other aspects that we have analyzed the fdi policy will have a bearing so it is there for you to read uh, take it will impact takeovers and acquisitions inflows of investment as i have just discussed and also significant uh, beneficial ownership as i have just mentioned next please yes next slide is about the relaxation board meetings as you all again may be knowing that a company in india is required to hold four board meetings in a financial year with a gap of not exceeding 120 days between two consecutive board meetings further there are a restriction on certain agenda items which cannot be held through audio visual means for board meeting the ministry of corporate affairs has relaxed these corporate compliances such as holding board meetings uh, and also has exempted physical presence of directors for approval for many item uh, let's say uh, annual financial statement board report etc consequently such meetings may be held through video conferencing or other audio visual means where these meetings were scheduled to be held between march 19th to 30th of june the prescribed interval period for holding board meetings has now been extended by a period of another 60 days that is from the existing 120 days to 180 days until the next two quarter that is for the quarter ending june and september next similarly all companies are required to hold their annual general meetings within 6 months from the date of closure of the financial year therefore companies whose financial year has ended on december 31st which was statutorily required to hold their annual general meeting by june 30th uh that is within 6 months from december uh, 2019 such companies are now permitted to hold their agm within a period of 9 uh, months which will end on september 30th 2020 uh further it would be very interesting to note that there was no provision in the companies act uh, which allowed audio visual means for participation in general meetings therefore due to the online lockdown ongoing lockdown the ministry has permitted certain member matters of urgent nature uh, which may be requiring approval from shareholders to be passed through resolution in extraordinary general meetings conducted through video conferencing or audio visual means 
uh, such meetings it is it will be beneficial to those extraordinary general meetings which were scheduled to be held between march 19th until june 30th next slide please uh relax there, there's some relaxation in the insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016 ibc as we call it and i've in fact there are many relaxations and many amendments as you all might be noticing that insolvency bankruptcy board is issuing new clarification new amendment every day but i have purposefully selected the one which is most uh, relevant will have bearing for all kinds of client whether on whether the defaulters due to ongoing coronavirus or which will get impacted by default so uh, you know the main section was section 4 uh, which defined uh, the eligibility to file any application under the court and the minimum threshold was rupees 100000 implying that in case the company defaults in repayment of any debt on account of supply of material or services or provision of finance the creditor with as low debt as rupees 1 1 lakh or 100000 rupees could sue the company leading to either forcing the company to repay the money in priority over other claims or to take over uh, facilitate or lead to take over of the company by someone else or ultimately if there was no bidder liquidation of the company the threshold led to several applications being filed against the defaulting companies and defaults which were committed in repayment of such small debts so creators mostly operational creators who supplied goods and services to the companies would often drag the companies into insolvency proceedings to recover their claims the amount of rupees 100000 which is just over 1300 us dollar would lead to disp disproportionate powers in the hands of creditors and led to a blatant misuse of the resolution process as defined in the code this led to a deluge of a flood of applications and it wasted a lot of time of the adjudicating authorities therefore uh, in exercise of its power uh, the government of india raised the minimum default threshold limit to its maximum capacity as given in the ibc to 1 crore rupees or 10 million rupee which is just a little over us uh, us 131000 dollars so this will give much breather to you know companies in times of coronavirus as the entire economy is under lockdown so the finance minister stated that meeting the obligations during this crisis and also secondly to safeguard the interest of msmes and the companies operating in small scale sectors next uh foreign trade policy the ministry of commerce and industry in view of you know COVID situation uh the ensuing pandemic has decided to continue relief under various export promotion schemes by granting extension of the existing foreign trade policy by another one year up to 31st march 2021 for example benefits uh under all the export promotion scheme subject to some exceptions uh, which are available all as on date will continue to be available for another 12 months uh, validative period of status holder certificate has also been expanded, extended uh, letter of intent has been extended timelines for filing various application for refund duty drawback and various reports and returns have also been extended next and then there are certain additional relaxation in fact they were plenty but then i thought I'll pick up the most relevant uh, to companies uh, which we cater to or all or all companies uh, for example relaxation for newly incorporated entities uh, as you may be knowing that a newly incorporated company have to file a certificate of commencement of business by six months uh, this has been extended by another six months then uh, relaxation for resident director for financial year 2019-20 non-compliance of minimum residency in india for a period of at least 182 days by at least one director of every company shall not be treated as a violation for example uh, let's say a lot of our clients uh, who are expatriate who were residing in india had to leave in you know india due to this outbreak of coronavirus uh, either in the month of february or march 
which may result in deficiency in the number of days they stayed in India. This relaxation would ensure that such companies and directors are not treated as, as non-compliant. It's a very important amendment. Then, uh, you no know, deferment of companies auditor report, which was due to come during financial year 1920, has been ap made applicable for financial year 2021. Similarly, no additional fee would be charged for any any late filing during during the moratorium period, that is from April 1st to September 30th. In respect of any document or return statement which may be required to be filed with the ministry, irrespective of its due date. Next. Uh, there are certain clarifications on corporate social responsibility front, which are important, given that every company is now closing its account. So the Ministry of Corporate Affairs have clarified that the spending of CSR funds for COVID-19 uh, and making contribution to PMKS fund is eligible CSR activity. The CSR may be spent for various activity relating to COVID-19, such as uh, maybe related obligation hence it is applicable to all companies and irrespective of whether they have any legal obligations for csr contribution will not be treated as csr expenditure however if any extra share payment is made to temporary casual workers or daily wage workers over and above the disbursement of wages specifically for the purpose of fighting covid 19 the same shall be admissible towards csr expenditure as a one-time exception the management must take a must make a delay uh, declaration uh, which should be certified by the statutory auditor stating that a payment is in the nature of ex cashier uh, of course uh, logic says it's primarily permitted to take care of blue collared worker during these difficult times of the global pandemic next so there was some announcement made by reserve bank of india also uh, so RBI has, you know, given out uh, certain measures such as specialized lending institution as uh, NABAD, uh, National Housing Board or SIDBI uh, have been provided liquidity, liquidity facility of rupees 50,000 crore or INR 500 billion to enable lending to small and medium enterprises, housing sector. So these institutions play a very important role to meet long-term funding requirements of rural sectors and areas such as agriculture small industries nbfc and microfinance institutions and tightening of financial condition during covid 19 has made it very difficult for these institutions to raise resources from the market further banks have allowed three months moratorium on all loans as well as interest on loans have also been deferred by three months as you all may be knowing that value of goods or software export is required to be realized and repatriated to India within nine months from the date of export. The time period for realization and repatriation of such exports made up to July 31st, 2020 has been extended to 15 months from the date of export. Next. So uh, besides there were some measures which the government has taken to facilitate small, medium and micro enterprises. So, uh, you know, to, to help support the efforts uh, and to address COVID-19 emergencies, uh, SIDBI, which is Small Industrial Development uh, Bank of India, is supporting micro, small and medium enterprises which are manufacturing products or which are providing services related to fighting the coronavirus. Uh, and they have announced certain uh, measures and schemes to encourage investment in these areas. For example, uh, the scheme called SIDBI Assistance to Facilitate Emergency Response Against Coronavirus, in short, SAFE scheme and the SAFE Plus. Under these schemes, loans have been extended at a very low rate of about 5% within a very short you know, uh, turnaround time of 48 hours. This is primarily done 
to you know uh, encourage production of permitted drugs uh, and articles which can be used for coronavirus treatment such as ventilator eye protection protective gowns oxygen cylinders testing labs uh, and other medical devices the uh, another scheme which is very important is uh, is called smile so this schemes which has been floated by sidbi is catering to the healthcare sector only under which medium and long term loans at very nominal rate of interest will be provided for financing healthcare sector for example to finance capital investment uh, in, in areas of hospitals nursing homes clinics etc uh, you know to to enable these uh, institutions or uh, or let's say uh, infrastructures to be able to fight coronavirus uh, effectively next so this takes me to conclusion of my slides uh, if you have any question please do uh, let me know at the end of the session in now i would uh, pass on the baton to my uh, next speaker uh, aparna who would uh, you know talk about contractual obligations during times of covid 19 over to you aparna thank you thank you himanshu and good afternoon everyone um himanshu just covered the various regulatory relaxations and changes that have been announced in light of covid 19 we've now come to the next part of this webinar where i'm going to talk about the impact that covid 19 has had on the commercial obligations of businesses that any commercial relationships that a business has with customers with third party service providers or suppliers the question is whether these contractual obligations that a business has entered into before the pandemic do they continue as normal or is there a reason to suspend or reevaluate these obligations in light of the pandemic and the devastating economic effect it has had across the board so i am going to first of all give you next slide please i'm going to first give you the framework the legal framework within which to consider this question and then i will speak about briefly about the impact on different parties such as buyers on the one hand and sellers and vendors on the other hand when you consider your contracts and look to see whether these contracts the performance should continue as before or whether there's a reason to either amend them or suspend them at the moment next slide please so the first thing to look at are the terms of the contract themselves right and the contract typically what has happened now is force majeure has become a household word in these days and some contracts do contain a force majeure clause there is some confusion over what exactly a force majeure clause may be it is force majeure refers to an act of god such as a natural calamity war or other event that is not foreseeable by the parties at the time that they entered into the contract and that prevents the performance of a party's contractual obligations so if the force majeure clause is properly invoked then the party that has invoked this clause is excused from performing the obligation typically and historically this concept has been construed very narrowly but now in light of covid-19 and the fact that it has affected businesses across the board it's being invoked and there's a lot more discussion around this so one question we've all received from our clients is on the language of the clause itself does it actually have to say the word use the word epidemic or pandemic and while these kinds of uh, Uh, references would definitely be helpful very often a force majeure clause even if it just contains a catch all phrase to say that other list certain events and then says other similar events and specifically if it refers to government regulations that is something that would be very helpful here in being able to invoke the force majeure clause it's important to understand that the time period 
of the force majeure clause, the time period during which the obligation of a contract is to perform the obligation of a contract is suspended, applies only when that force majeure event is actually in place. So for example, if the force majeure event being invoked is the lockdown that prevents a factory from uh, uh, resuming its normal operations, if the lockdown is lifted in that area after May 3rd, then that particular force measure event would no longer be applicable. So it's important to understand that force measure may not necessarily excuse a party from its obligations uh, in a blanket manner, but only for the period during which that particular issue applies. And lastly, it is important to read the contract carefully they often will contain a specific procedure of how the force measure clause can be invoked. And this does need to be followed. So it's not okay to think that, well, in this day and age, everybody is invoking the force measure clause and therefore notice may not need to be provided. It's important to review the terms of the contract and then follow all the requirements stipulated therein. So after that, once you've looked at the terms of the contract, then we'll have to consider whether the specific, what is the specific force measure event that we're invoking and whether it has actually prevented a party's, uh, the performance of a party's obligations under the contract. And this is typically a very fact specific analysis, even when we are faced with a universal event such as COVID-19 and the various containment measures. Next slide, please. So before going into what could be a force measure event, it's also important to understand what will not typically constitute a force measure event. And the test for this is that the performance actually has to have been made impossible or extremely difficult. So for example, if a factory is closed down because of the lockdown, and therefore cannot manufacture the good. That could be a good reason to invoke force measure. Similarly, if it's a logistics company and because of the containment measures and the disruption to supply chain, travel is not permitted and deliveries are not permitted, that could constitute a force measure as well. On the other hand, mere reduction of profits or increased costs of doing business would not typically constitute a force measure event. So for example, if it just becomes more expensive to procure the raw materials, or the demand for a particular product reduces because in light of the pandemic or the lockdown, those kinds of issues in themselves may not constitute a force measure. Next slide, please. Um, I'll now move on to what happens if there is no force measure clause in the contract. And even in this case, then you would have to look at contract law and the Indian Contract Act specifically. And even if there is no specific force measure clause, it's possible to terminate a party's obligations under a contract by invoking the doctrine of frustration under Section 56 of the Indian Contract Act. In this case, doctrine of frustration would mean that there's an act that has occurred outside of the contract, that's outside of the party's uh, control, which makes performance impossible. It is similar to force measure. It is a very high bar and has been very narrowly construed in case law. It's used for a very limited purpose. But again, in light of COVID-19 and especially for contracts where time of the, is of the essence and performance is really impossible, one could consider whether Section 56 can be invoked. One important distinction between force measure and uh, Section 56 is that while force measure could suspend the obligation of performance, section 56 means that the, the purpose of the contract itself is frustrated. So the effect of using section 56 is that the contract gets terminated. Next slide, please. The final part of the framework to keep in mind is that in light of COVID-19, the government has issued various advisories, industry specific as well as across the board, 
and the financial the ministry of finance issued a notification an office memorandum in february saying that the as a result of the disruption to supply chains force measure could be invoked where appropriate and various other ministries have also followed suit after this and while these office memorandums it's not very clear that they have legal um they're legally binding they would definitely be of persuasive value and can be and they would definitely help for industries uh, specifically relying to invoke force measure clauses but even in this case the terms of the contract would need to be considered next slide please so now i'm going to go on to talk about the impact on buyers and sellers and any specific uh, points that need to be kept in mind if you take any contract and even very complex contracts if they're made i mean if you think about them very simply they would usually involve buying of either a good or a service so that one party has an obligation to make a payment and the other party has an obligation to either deliver the good or service of course there could be combination contracts where contracts provide for both the uh, provision of a good and a service and different parties could have a variety of obligations but this is what most contracts would reduce to in their bare essence and there is of course another kind of contract which are financing contracts that i'm not covering here but we could talk about it in the q and a if uh, people have questions on that so can a, if you are the buyer in a contract can you invoke a force majeure clause in this regard it's important to remember that typically the buyer's obligation would be a payment obligation and a payment obligation is typically not affected by force measure because as of today there have been no issues with banks are functioning and payments can be made and therefore in light of that it's going to be very difficult to invoke force majeure in or if the only obligation that you have in the contract is to make a payment and this was recently looked at also in a bombay high court judgment where the buyer tried to say to use force majeure in a contract with a supplier of steel and in this case the court first of all the, the force majeure clause in this contract applied only to the seller and the seller had not invoked it in this situation the seller was actually able to uh, ship the steel at that time because steel was considered an essential service and the court made very clear that here first of all the force measure clause applied only to the seller but also that it's not okay the buyer couldn't invoke force measure for extraneous reasons such as for example the fact that the buyer's put own purchasers and counterparties would be affected and therefore the it's as they wouldn't be placing any orders with the buyer that's not a reason for the buyer to be able to ex be excused from performance of its obligations towards the seller next slide please now coming on to sellers and vendors in this case it's important first of all it's easier in this case to invoke force measure because most suppliers of goods or services would have been affected significantly by the lockdown and may not actually be able to perform their contract but even here it is a very fact specific analysis of both what exactly is the event that you're claiming to be a force measure event and secondly has that event made the specific performance in your contract impossible it's also important here to be able to rely on industry specific guidelines on these issues depending on the industry um next slide please on the whole we do think that courts are likely to take a liberal interpretation of contractual obligations during this time and we did see for example that the delhi high court in a recent judgment did allow the a project a construction project could not be completed and the delhi high court said yes in this these are extraordinary circumstances and times and therefore the party should be given a little more time 
post lifting of the lockdown to complete the project. So this is probably going to be the case in a number of supply side contracts or the obligations of suppliers, especially in cases such as infrastructure or construction. This is probably a trend we're going to see. Next slide, please. Lastly, um, I just wanted to talk briefly that force measure is probably not the only clause you can rely on. Apart from invoking the force measure clause, many of you may also be trying to renegotiate or amending your contract terms in light of the pandemic. In this case, one thing to be uh, to realize is that COVID-19 is no longer a non unforeseeable event. So if you're going to be drafting new force measure clauses, you would have to think about this because the event of a, for a force measure clause does need to be uh, unforeseeable. So this is something that you would have to take into account when drafting new contracts. I will now turn it over to uh, my partner, Junera, who will now take us to the last part of the presentation, which is on employer-employee relationships. Over to you, Junera. Thank you, Aparna, and good afternoon, everyone who's joined us today. So as Himanshu and Aparna have specified, and as we are all aware, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on all aspects of life and business. And I'm going to be talking about the impact that COVID-19 has had on the people of an organization. Next slide, please. So essentially, the lockdown has majorly reduced business activities in India and across the world. And this has put a severe strain on cash flow and reserves of almost all organizations, giving rise to certain critical issues that are grappling the minds of employers, some of which are whether payments need to be made to your workforce during these times when uh, organizations are under a lockdown. Can an employer implement a no work, no wage rule? Is this permissible legally? Whether employees can be terminated or laid off when there is no work? Do statutory payments like EPF and ESI, et cetera, need to be made for employees during the lockdown and so on and so forth? I would be focusing on two of the most important issues that are being debated in industry today, uh, which is essentially the permissibility of wage and workforce reductions during the lockdown and thereafter. I'll also talk a little bit on the enforceability of these orders and advisories, which have been issued by the government in connection with labor and employment issues in light of COVID. And lastly, I'll delve upon some of the practical insights on contractual and regulatory issues that need to be kept in mind by an organization, if at all, they implement any sort of wage or workforce restructurings during the pandemic. Moving on to the next slide, please. So here, um, so we'll talk a little bit on uh, payment of wages to your employees during the lockdown. So typically what happens is in employer-employee relationships, these are governed by employment contracts. So an employer is required to pay salary to an employee in consideration of the employment contract and for the work that is performed by an employee. Now with the reduced productivity or in some cases a complete stoppage of work, the point that is you know, being deliberated is can an employer reduce or not pay wages to its workers who are not able to work or are working lesser than what they contractually agreed? The plain answer to that is no because there are multiple government orders and advisories that have been issued in India in light of COVID-19, which specify that employers must not avoid, must avoid any form of wage reductions during the lockdown. Out of all of these orders and advisories, I'll focus on the two most important ones. The first being an order of March 20th, which was issued by the Ministry of Labor and Employment. The ministry basically has advised employers not to reduce wages of its employees. And it goes a step further to say that if an employee is on leave during the pandemic, or if an organization is rendered non-operational on account of the lockdown, such employees are deemed to be on duty. So essentially what that means is that even if an employee is not able to discharge his or her duties as he would normally be able to do, 
such employee would be deemed to be on duty and will actually be contractually entitled to full wages. Another relevant order that came out on March 29th is by the Ministry of Home Affairs under the Disaster Management Act. This order went ahead to say that no employer of a shop establishment or an industry will be allowed to reduce or deduct the wages of its employees during the lockdown. And unlike the other advisories, this uh, specifically sets out that it is a mandatory order under the Disaster Management Act and therefore needs to be compulsorily complied with. Moving to the next slide, please. States have uh, followed suit and issued similar orders and advisories. In fact, uh, uh, states of uh, Maharashtra, Delhi, Telangana have invoked the Epidemic Diseases Act and they've issued mandatory orders to avoid wage reductions. One interesting point that I wanted to highlight is that these various orders and advisories, they've treated permanent and temporary casual and contract workers of an organization on the same footing. So essentially, uh, while uh, with respect to contract workers in your organization as a principal employer, while you're not under you know, a mandatory obligation, you're not the primary person who's required to pay wages. The contract labor legislation requires a principal employer to come in uh, and pay wages if the contractor is unable to do so. So in these kind of situations, if the contractor is not in a position to pay wages, as a principal employer, you will need to step in. Of course, there are you know, you can seek, uh, you would be entitled to seek reimbursements uh, from the contractor at a later stage. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, payment of wages, uh, you would have to treat both your permanent employees as well as any temporary or contract workers on the same day. Another interesting bit that I wanted to highlight is a circular that was issued. I think uh, Himanshu briefly mentioned on this. Uh, was regarding uh, the NCA circular on what could constitute expenditures towards a CSR, ex uh, what, what would constitute CSR expenses for a company. Here the NCA has gone ahead to clarify that payment of salary to employees would not be a CSR expense. Now, one line of thought or discussion that's happening within the industry is to say that because the NCA has clarified that Salary payment of salary is a moral obligation and it cannot be construed as a CSR expense. There is some amount of interpretation happening that the MCA has, uh, the, the clarification provided by the MCA has diluted the mandatory effect of the order that was issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs. In my understanding, that's not the case because the MCA. Um, Primarily, uh, you know, they 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 they're not they don't have the powers to issue orders with respect to payment of wages to employees. They regulate the workings and functionings of a company and an LLC. All that they did in the circular was to specify what would be a CSR expense versus not. So, uh, just on account of them specifying or say stating that it is a moral expense, uh, you know, moral obligation and not a statutory obligation, it doesn't really take away or dilute the uh, orders which have been issued by the Labor Ministry and the Home uh, Home Affairs Ministry that salaries should not be reduced during the lockdown. Next slide, please. Here we'll talk a little bit on workforce reductions during lockdown. So the uh, the, the some rule is that during the lockdown, terminations should be avoided. Advisories and orders issued by the Ministry of Labor and the state governments all specify that employers must avoid any form of terminations during COVID. One aspect I wanted to specify, uh, highlight is the March 29th order that was issued under the Disaster Management Act, which basically is uh, you know mandatorily reduce uh, uh, prohibits any form of wage reductions that formally or technically doesn't talk about terminations however it could be interpreted to mean that termination is nothing but an ultimate form of wage reduction so you know essentially terminations could also be deemed to be prohibited under the uh, uh, you know home uh, home ministry order next slide please so here 
um, we'll discuss a little bit on the enforceability of these various orders and advisories issued in light of employment issues. So the question is whether these orders and advisories by the government, are they enforceable and binding in nature? What is very important is that we need to understand the language which is used in these orders. While some of them are in the nature of advices to stakeholders, the others impose mandatory obligations. However, having said that, with respect to the advisories that have been issued, given that the intent, given the intent with which they have been issued, the idea is that they should be adhered to. In fact, uh, the Supreme Court in one of its uh, recent orders when they were uh, in connection with a migrant worker issue, they have gone ahead to observe that stakeholders must actually comply with advisories which are issued in the nature of orders. And in fact, say that any failure to do so can attract penalties under the Indian Penal Code as well. And as I've already mentioned, with respect to the directives and orders that are issued under specific legislations like the Disaster Management Act or the Epidemic Diseases Act, they, um, by virtue of their language itself, clarify that they are binding in nature uh, and any failure to comply with these could attract penal consequences. There's one bit uh, with respect to the March 29th order. Uh, I would like to highlight that this has been challenged in the Supreme Court. Uh, there have been various petitions that have been filed in connection challenging the constitutional validity of this order to the extent that, uh, you know, under the Disaster Management Act, they have mandated private and public establishments to pay 100% wages. Uh, this has also been admitted, but we are yet to hear. Uh, we need to wait and watch as to what comes out and, uh, you know, how the, how the Supreme Court uh, views this matter. Next slide, please. So here I'll briefly, um, you know, address some of the practical insights and best practices on that an organization must adopt with respect to its employees during the lockdown and thereafter. So as I've already mentioned, the thumb rule is during the lockdown that you should avoid wage or workforce reductions. Post lockdown, unless there is, you know, we need to also look for if there are any exemptions that are issued uh, by the government, but on account, if there are unavoidable circumstances and if an organization is actually going down the route of restructuring wage or, you know, implementing workforce reductions, then it's very important that you need to comply with the regulatory uh, and contractual obligations. And uh, the, you know, here the process or deciding factor would be largely whether the employees in question, are they workmen or non-workmen? So effectively, uh, the difference between a workman and non-workman is uh, for workmen are people who are employed in an industry. An industry need not only be a manufacturing unit or a factory, it can be any establishment where there is a any form of trade uh, uh, or business being carried on. But within these uh, industries, uh, persons who are employed in technical, manual, clerical work, repetitive in nature, who are not managers or administrators, the processes set out for them in terms of workforce or wage reductions are far more stringent because they have a lesser bargaining power as opposed to uh, the managerial or executive employees. For them, in addition to the employment contracts, it is very important that you, as an employer, you follow the procedures and provisions set out under the Industry Dispute Act. For instance, if you are reducing wages of a workman, it is important that uh, you know a 21 days notice is issued to the workman prior to implementing this reduction. Another aspect that needs to be borne in mind in terms of wage reductions is that uh, you should not, uh, you should endeavor not to go below the minimum wage. Minimum wages are stipulated by uh, each uh, state government uh, under the Minimum Wages Act. So any wage reduction should ensure that you're not going below the minimum wage. So to that extent, uh, the basic uh, uh, wages, dearness allowance, HRA, et cetera, should not be touched. In terms of workforce reduction for workers, it could effectively either be a retrenchment or a layoff uh, 
And in these kind of cases as well, the procedures set out on the I, under the ID Industrial Dispute Act will need to be complied with. And uh, what is the process to be followed will again depend on how many workmen are employed uh, in the industry at that point in time. So for establishments which have more than uh, uh, 100 work, uh, workmen, they do need, or 300 in certain states, you need to also seek approval from the appropriate government prior to implementing a layoff or a, a retrenchment. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, non-workmen, these are um, essentially your managers, administrators, executives, supervisors in, uh, uh, in an entity, could be in an industry or otherwise. Here, uh, this processes for any form of wage or workforce reductions are you know, comparatively easier because their employer employment relationships are largely governed by the contract. And of course, the state specific uh, shops and commercial act uh, uh, establishment legislations. Because they are driven by contracts, one thing to bear in mind is that uh, it would be helpful if any form of wage reductions here, here are, uh, you know, voluntarily discussed and agreed upon. And uh, it could either be graded pay cuts or deferments, etc. That depends on what the discussions are, but it should, uh, employers should endeavor to discuss this and voluntarily have the employee agree upon it. Uh, Bit, one aspect that needs to be, uh, you know, you need to be, employer needs to be careful of is that many a time salary structures, breakups, etc., are set out in the contract and amendments to any contract require both parties to sign off in writing. So effectively, if, you know, these kind of provisions are there in the employment contract of persons who you want to reduce wages for, you should go back and try and ensure that any of these wage reduction uh, aspects are, uh, uh, you know, are agreed upon in writing as well. Uh, again, basic uh, minimum wage, uh, if applicable to any of these uh, executives as well, uh, you should uh, ensure that you don't, uh, your reductions don't go below the minimum wage so that you're not uh, flouting the minimum wage legislation. In terms of termination, again, very, very important that uh, we look at the employment contract, the termination provisions in the employment contract would typically have a minimum notice period or a salary in lieu of that notice period that needs to be complied with if you are looking at uh, asking the employer to move on. Uh, in addition to that, the state specific shops acts also typically have provisions uh, which uh, regulate termination of uh, employment. They also require uh, a, a particular amount of notice to be provided to employees before any kind of terminations. So essentially you should uh, align the contract with, uh, uh, with the uh, specific law of the state of that um, uh, relevant. And if at all the provisions under the SHOPS Act, the law is more beneficial in terms of termination, then that notice uh, or salary in your notice is set out in the law should be provided as that would prevail over the contract. These are some of the best practices that you should be, uh, you know, uh, as employers should be bearing in mind, if at all, uh, you're looking at a wage or a workforce reduction, whether during the lockdown or thereafter. I'll hand it over to uh, Akanksha now. Thank you. Thank you, Janera. Thank you, Janera. Thank you, all the speakers. We shall now take the question session. Uh, I believe this first question, I will pass it on to Himanshu. So the question is, what is the adverse effect of FDI to be forecasted? Well, uh, uh... Uh, FDI in generally, I am sure everyone understand that due to due to this COVID-19 situation, wherein international travel is not possible or everywhere, you know, it's locked down. So the business will definitely will be impacted, as Ajay also mentioned in his opening address. But I believe your question is primarily related to press note number three, which I covered. So uh, you know, going by uh, what what is provided by the government. Uh, I believe that uh, while this provision will not have any impact on the existing investment by Chinese entities, but any fresh infusion of funds by Chinese entities would uh, definitely get slowed down as now the entire process or the bureaucracy 
will come into play and you know a specific approval would, would be required this uh, you know of course might open a lot of uh, there's a room for litigation because there might be existing contracts between uh, investors uh, and entities in india so uh, it is yet to be seen how each uh, you know party would react to their contractual rights under these contracts besides uh, i i believe and i have studied this uh, you know over the internet lifeline these days is that uh, indian companies which have uh, existing chinese invest investment are as of now adequately funded however those companies which are in requirement of fund uh, you know with chinese investor or chinese subsidiaries in india they will now have to resort to alt and explore alternate uh, sources of finance so in short yes definitely there's going to be an impact uh, investments are going to get slow down but i in my personal view i think these are uh, these are important changes and many other countries have also you know introduced these kind of restrictions just to ensure that the business is done uh, once the things get normal they are you know back to business in normal co cases as and no predatory uh, acquisition should be allowed during this uh, you know situation of helplessness so i i hope this would answer your question if you further need any clarification do let me know thank you akanksha thank you himanshu the next question i would direct it to aparna so the question is is force majeure applicable on insurance contracts aparna over to you Sure, thank you, Akansha. And that question, it's an interesting question that has come up recently, and it will depend very much on the actual terms of the insurance contract. So it is quite tax specific. However, insurance companies, I think recently life insurance companies have specifically announced that COVID-19 will not be considered as a force measure event. And that, you know, for example, if there's um, including COVID-19 deaths, for example, would not be a reason to, the insurance policy would still be recoverable in that situation. But it depends very much. It is a fact-specific analysis. It depends on what exactly the policy would have to say. Um, I'm happy to, if you had further questions on this, happy to discuss that. But it's a fairly fact-specific question. Thank you, Aparna. That was crisp. Uh, we take the next question to Janera. So the question is, any update on the terminated employees welfare bill 2020? Janera, over to you. Uh, thanks, Akanksha. So this bill was introduced as a private member bill in Rajya Sabha in Feb, February of this year. Uh, it's, it's, still, uh, it's not yet been passed. So it's, it's still in the Rajya Sabha. Thanks, Janera. And in terms uh, of, uh, please go ahead. So, sorry, Akansha. So in terms of um, you know implementation, uh, even if it, this was in effect, the current uh, construct of that bill basically says that you would be providing termination benefits to private employees of private and uh, public establishments which undergo winding up on account of an economic slowdown, etc. So. You know, there has to be a winding up or a closing of business uh, as such that needs to be implemented for the benefits under the bill to uh, apply to a, uh, you know, a terminated employee. But that's only the text of the bill that was introduced in the Rajya Sabha. I mean, we'll have to see how it pans out as it uh, goes to the next stage. Thank you. Uh, this next question, I would again direct this to Himanshu. So the question states for video conference or other audio visual means which tools you would like to suggest also the second part of the question is do we need to keep the recording of the video conferences that we are holding through in the board meetings over to you himanshu okay so uh, you know these are uh, the tools that we normally use so uh, even presently, we are using to service our client, uh, you know, called uh, either Skype or uh, let's say Blue Jeans, or uh, you know, some of my colleagues have been using Jabber. Zoom was very 
popular until a week before but due to the security issue uh, so yes uh, you know so th these are some available uh, softwares in the market uh, which if you you know uh, take an authorized uh, product you may ensure uh, integrity of the meeting uh, with no infringement uh, by unauthorized person uh, second second part yes uh, we would suggest that you should keep the recordings of all these meetings uh, just to you know keep as an evidence of decisions and discussions uh, so as to you know if uh, need be in future these can be referred to or may be shown to uh, let's say depending upon the agenda could be shown to the various stakeholders including government thank you thank you manshu uh, since we are running out of time we are just going to take this question as the last question so it's a very direct question i'll again pass or, uh, pass this on to himanshu contribution to cm fund will not qualify as csr expenditure is it yes thank you himanshu this is this was very clear thank you himanshu again aparna and junaira for a great session it was engaging educative and crisp we actually have a lot of questions which remain unanswered and i could see there are some in relation to financial aspects also so the questions which are in relation to financial aspect i would recommend you all to you know just attend our next webinar which is to be held on april 29th that is tomorrow on financial reporting and challenges in times of covid 19 for other unanswered questions we will directly reach you out personally over your email ids thank you speakers once again thank you to the wonderful and engaging audience for any concerns please do reach us out thank you so much thank you thank you thank you